I think it's important that we describe to the audience that uh, the first concept that you really want to hear when you talk to a doctor about curative therapy uh, is whether it's myeloablative or non-myeloablative, okay? Because if you can just break the world up into myeloablative and non-myeloablative, you'll understand who is likely to be um, at risk for complications versus less complications. So it turns out that all gene therapy that's being utilized now is myeloablative. That's the most toxic chemotherapy that we have available to essentially wipe out the bone marrow. That is by definition. Because the adults have so many complications with their heart, lung, and kidney disease, they were not eligible for myeloablative chemotherapy. So they weren't eligible for cure. So what you just heard Dr. Jones say is what they pioneered at Johns Hopkins over 20 years ago was a strategy to offer curative therapy for the group of adults who needed to be cured of the disease or wanted to be cured of the disease, but were not eligible because all of the match-related donor transplants were myeloablative. So when we say myeloablative, we're typically referring to match-related donor, although there are some now non-myeloablative match-related donor protocols. Gene therapy is myeloablative, and gene editing is myeloablative. What's not myeloablative is related haploidentical transplants. We call that non-myeloablative. So that's the first it's a really important distinguishing feature, and we really should stop saying gene therapy and gene editing. We should use the terminology myeloablative gene therapy and myeloablative gene editing to give you a descriptor. 